Hello everyone. I am Mustafa Hussain, Marketing Manager at Upside Learning. I warmly welcome you all for today's webinar, Go Beyond Ticking the Boxes with Compliance Training by Upside Learning. Here we are, we will be sharing some inspiring real examples with you. This year, we are celebrating completion of 15 years of del delivering great learning solutions. Over the course of this journey, our team of 120 professionals have delivered 20,000 hours of learning successfully, completing more than 5,000 projects with a 90% repeat business from our clients across the globe. For today's session, we have with us Amit Garg, founder and director of Upside Learning. Amit is a veteran of 19 years in work workplace learning domain. He consults organizations around the world on resolving business and training challenges and is passionate about improving organization performance through better learning solutions. Amit has also been consistently listed amongst the top movers and shakers in e-learning industry for the past many years. Amit is joined by Niti, who is the lead instructional designer at Upside Learning. Niti has worked in ID for over seven years with rich experience of working on a variety of projects for domains such as aviation, banking, project management, and service industries, among others. Over to you, Amit and Niti. Thanks, Mustafa. And hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this session on going beyond with compliance training as we try to really go beyond ticking the boxes. Uh, I'll, I'll first let Niti say a quick hello before we move on. Hi everyone, Niti here. Glad you could join. All right. Okay, so just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we will be recording this, so you will receive a recording later. And if you have any questions, use the Q&A. Uh, button that you would probably see at the bottom of your screen to drop a note. Uh, if we can answer that, uh, uh, you know, through text, we can do that in the chat itself, or we'll answer it to everybody on the forum. If we can't cover your questions today, uh, we'll definitely come back with the consolidated answers to any queries that left unanswered today. Great. So let's get started. Uh, how we have laid this out uh, for today is, uh, I'll just take you through a few slides about outside learning. The one which is up there, you can just notice all the clients that we have, some of those that we have listed. Uh, but after that, I'll, try, I'll, I'll share some research on compliance training uh, we have been part of. And uh, then primarily Neeti will be taking you through four you know, examples that we have chosen for today's demonstration. Uh, Two of them are, you know, client uh, delivered projects. One is very close to finishing and one is still in design phase. So they're all very exciting to take a look at. Uh, so let's begin. So of course, here's a list of uh, some of our clients. Uh, over these 15 years, we have picked up close to about 50 different awards uh, you know, from trade portals, from Brandon Hall, from LearnX, from others. But as a founder, uh, the one which is in the middle excites me the most. It's most satisfying to be certified as a great place to work earlier this year. In terms of our offerings, you know, we pretty much do from custom e-learning to videos and animations to mobile apps to AR VR solutions. And if you have been following us on you know, social channels or through a blog or newsletters. I'm sure you've seen this uh, logo go beyond, which is uh, essentially our, you know, nudge to the L&D community uh, to go beyond and try and make business impact. You know, it's been, uh, there's been far too much training that is being created, which does nothing more than ticking the box. And I'm sure all of us on this forum know that. Uh, we are trying our bit to, to see how we can help 
clients really deliver business impact with the solutions. Uh, we have been successful with you know many of those uh, nudges, if I can call them. Uh, not so successful with some of them. But yes, we we stay the course, and we are really uh, excited about taking this mainstream as one of our key initiatives going forward. Within the go beyond umbrella, uh, compliance is really our you know big focus area to begin with. And why uh, that that's been chosen? So compliance is something that every organization does. You know there are two ways about it. Uh, but at the same time, compliance is also the first impression that most uh, new joinees in an organization get. And quite disappointingly, it is not a great experience uh, as everybody really involved in creating compliance training is looking to take the box. Essentially, what it is doing is it is spoiling the L&D brand in our view. So imagine if you join a new organization and you're given 20, 30, 40, you know, there are some organizations which give even 60, especially in the banking and finance domain, compliance programs to a new joinee in the first month of joining. And they are essentially not doing it, anything beyond that, just doing compliance training for a month or so. I think it is quite frustrating. And given the way compliance training is created, it is definitely not very inspiring. I think there's a great opportunity to convert that to you know, make a better impression and let compliance be handled in a way that it can lead the brand rather than spoil the brand. So that's one of the areas that we are trying to focus on, on you know, how do we leverage compliance to make it deliver both business results and does not spoil the L&D brand. It may be doing for a lot of organizations, you know. Okay, so what are we doing on it? You know, uh, since we launched this, uh, call it a campaign around compliance training, going beyond with that, uh, we have uh, released an ebook which is well researched on, you know, from various research sources uh, on what's the state of compliance and what challenges people are facing, how can we resolve them. Uh, we've also included a lot of samples of our own work as well as others' work in that which are really outstanding. If you haven't really had your you know, chance to uh, have this ebook, please go ahead and do that. Uh, we've also you know, supported a trade portal webinar on this topic, bringing in an you know, external expert talk about this, you know, again, about the state of industry and what some of the more progressive organizations are doing in making compliance do better. And third is a Towards Maturity Research Report, which we had supported more recently, which I believe is a, you know, a short, crisp report, not very long, but it does make some very valid observations and suggestions. In fact, that is the report on which, you know, I'll, I'll spend a few more minutes so that we can just, you know, uh, see the lay of the land, you know, what are the challenges uh, LND is facing with compliance and what this report particularly suggests to be possible solutions. So let's let's get into this, you know. Uh, but before that, if you don't know about Towards Maturity, they essentially help L&D professionals based on their own 15 years of research practice. They interact and collect data from over 7,500 learning professionals and 55,000 learners in 83 different countries. So it's a fairly wide data set from across the world which essentially they're gathering from both the L&D community side as well as the learner side. So they can do some you know, juggling with that data and come out with some insights, which are very, very interesting. Uh, for this particular report, the, the one on compliance, which I'm showing on screen, they had about 700 organizations. We participated in the Tiverts Maturity Health Check for 2018 about 10,000 individuals who took their learning intelligence study and about 250 L&D professionals who took part in the compliance pulse study. So again, quite quite a diverse or, or reasonable sized database there. So what, what does the report say? You know, uh, on the state of compliance, what it is really telling us is 46% uh, organizations are reporting that people find compliance training dull and boring. Uh, I'm sure you won't find that very surprising. 31% uh, people 
are saying that they are not applying what they are learning in the mandatory courses. Now, this is something that we should you know, take note of because mostly compliance, what we are trying to do is measure what they have learned at the end of the program, which is if you want to call it a third factory level two. But beyond that, there is very little application that is happening. If I were to see this metric, I would probably say 69% uh, are the only ones who are probably applying. 31% are not even applying. They openly admit maybe there are more than that who are not applying. I think that is probably the biggest challenge that how much of application of compliance training is really happening. You know, knowledge jumping is one part, passing an assessment is another one, but we really need to get beyond to that application level. There's another interesting data point that this report has, which it picks up from a, from a different research, uh, which is around the cost of compliance. What is very interesting is for almost $1 spent on compliance, there is a $3 fine that the organizations are paying. Now, this is, you know, it may be very local. I, I believe that I haven't really you know, seen the source of myself in terms of what the data set was, but I believe it is for the European region and only for the data protection regulations. But the, the data is still very telling, you know, $1 of uh, a cost that you bear on creating compliance trading, you are spending $3 for uh, non-compliant, you know. So for L&D, typically we'll find that when we say, when, I'm, when, we are, when we approach, that let's do something better with your compliance training. The first, uh, if I can call it an excuse, is we don't have budgets. We can't be allocated more budgets. But then if you just compare it with how much budgets we are really letting go in fines, I think there may be some more budgets to you know, bring in to innovate the, the compliance training itself. The report identifies three key challenges to uh, that the compliance training is facing. Limited budgets, uh, large scale delivery, especially for multinational organizations which are spread around the world and constantly evolving content. That's the nature of compliance. Uh, it also picks up that 72% of learners are actually doing compliance through digital medium, which is the right way to go to address, you know, uh, in, in a way, all of these three challenges. However, there is still a problem in the way it is designed and positioned. So in terms of design, you know, uh, it is usually not designed for engagement. And in positioning, it is usually positioned as not so important enough for anybody to care. I mean, think about how much importance our managers are giving it or whether the senior management is giving it and is there a follow-up after the training program? So I think those are the two key aspects that they try and pick up, that while the digital solution is the right solution to go to, it can still be designed better. And if we can better position it, we will get much better results. So apart from just identifying what are the challenges, it also offers a, a, you know, a few solutions in terms of how to mitigate those challenges. Uh, there are three specific ones that they have listed using data and insights, adapting the learning design, which is coming from the last comment itself, and involving managers and leaders, which is again on the positioning side. Uh, and they suggest we can possibly leverage Richard Taylor's nudge theory in a bigger way now to influence that behavior. You know, essentially what you're saying is, uh, which if we utilize such uh, advancements in behavioral economics, you can possibly get people to see the value of compliance and engage with the necessary programs better. Uh, for each of these three, and I'll take a few more minutes just on these three before we get to the real samples. For each of these three, there are further insights that are available, which are also quite interesting. Uh, so for using data and insights, uh, only 32% of organizations are really collecting information on which learning points have been understood. So essentially, again, going back to the level two or third factory, you know, possibly through an assessment at the end of the course or a program. But this one is even more telling. 20% of organizations are collecting data or information from learners on the extent 
which the learning points are applied. So most others are not even collecting that data, you know, and that's where I think the, the real challenge. So you can reverse this data and say 80% organizations are not collecting that data. That makes it look even more, you know, uh, sad in, in a way. What's important is they have been able to draw a correlation between uh, the organizations that are generating meaningful data that can be used to measure and improve program effectiveness over time. These organizations are sustainably more likely to increase employee engagement. So what they are trying to do is juxtapose the various different data points that they have with if they are collecting uh, you know, the more meaningful data and using it in more effective manner, they are also showing well on employee engagement. You know, so there is a good correlation that they identified. And the last data point which I have on the screen is that about 16% organizations use learning analytics to improve services that they offer. You know, just 16%. I think in this day and age, this could be uh, the area to focus on to improve what LND is doing, you know, in terms of providing services to the organization, keeping the workforce, you know capable, uh, responsive, and of course, safe. So I think data use of learning analytics is, is, is a big uh, opportunity that really lies ahead of LND. Again, very interesting that this, according to them, the last data point, which is using learning analytics to improve services, this according to them is a very interesting or key signifier of an organization that is increasing employee engagement with compliance programs as well. Uh, just a few more things, you know, uh, which is under data and insights. So organizations that actively make compliance programs engaging are more likely to use insight, you know, uh, as they are doing these things. I'll not read out each of those, but just, just for you, the you know there are two sets of uh, groups that they have formed. One set is, which is depicted by blue, which is organizations that are actively making compliance courses engaging and the others, which are not actively making compliance courses engaging. What they are trying to bring up is there are several other parameters on which those organizations score much better. So again, this is coming from their, you know, different, uh, reports, not just the compliance one, but essentially they are mapping it against their overall uh, benchmark report that they publish. The second suggestion that they have is on adapting design, where majority feels that there is lack of attractive high quality content, and one third of learners say that the content is not uh, inspiring. So again, not very surprising. It just you know, underlines the point that compulsory programs need revitalization if we were to think of any behavior change being affected by that. And again, uh, comparing between those who are trying to actively do better compliance versus those who are not, uh, consistently organizations who are doing that consciously are scoring better on use of newer design or newer design techniques in their learning design, you know, storytelling, space learning. Uh, learning scenarios with real situations. And the third point, involve in managers. I, I believe this is, you know, uh, very, very crucial. And this uh, actually reminds me of, uh, you know, uh, stuff that uh, Professor Brinkerhoff, uh, Robert Brinkerhoff talks about where he essentially goes on to say, do not evaluate training because by evaluating just training, you may be missing on key aspects that need to be focused on as well. So for instance, before the training program, what is the kind of positioning you've done for that training? And after the training program, what kind of opportunities you've given for application of that knowledge? If both of those are missing, the pre and post training, the training itself may not mean much. And we saw that in one of the comments or, or data point that came out, a large number of uh, uh, learners are not applying what they are learning. So even if they have learned, they're not applying. Maybe those are the factors that also need to be seen if we have to really focus on making a business impact. 
But coming back to this, just the manager's part, you know, only 13% managers actively encourage behavioral change by supporting application of learning in the workplace. And the large majority say that the managers are reluctant to make time for learning. I think this, you know, apart from LND's biggest opportunity on using data, this is the other biggest challenge that they face, which is to involve managers and not just the line managers, but right from the top. So the, the buy-in from the top and active involvement from the line managers. So again, some comparative data points. And as you can see, there is you know some amount of uh, uh, correlation that we can see at least in data that the people who are trying to do, actively trying to do better compliance are scoring much better on so many factors. All right, so that's that's you know really all from the research uh, base that we have. We will jump into the samples that we have for you today, and uh, of course, Smriti will be doing most of the talking on the samples as she walks you through some of those demos that we have lined up for you. Uh, we have four of them. Uh, as I said, not all of them are completed projects. Two of them are. Two of them are not in various stages of completion. One is getting just about complete. The other one is somewhere in. But it's very, very exciting to still share. So the first one that we have is being done for A for E. It's uh, you know it's engagement through play where we bring in some amount of game elements. The background here is that A for E, which was uh, earlier A for E, it's now called People Plus. We worked with them when it was A for E. It's a recruitment and training company that offers frontline public services. They actually wanted to develop some training intervention for the appropriate and safe use of DSC and workstations. Now, this is a program which can easily deceive us to believe, or, or topic at least, where we say it's easy, it's simple, public, well understood. The challenge is that even after you understand, it is it does not stick with you. You tend to forget and you get into those, again, those you know relaxed postures and not conscious of that. And when pain hits you, then you start wondering about it again. So much so that HSE uh, states that work-related musculoskeletal disorders account for 35% of prevalent work-related illnesses in the year 2017-18. I think this is from the UK. And 25% of lost work days. That's huge. 25% of lost work days are coming from these. So clearly, while this training is happening more routinely in almost all organizations, it is not sticking and people are not applying. So we try to take a route where we will involve them in active uh, experience through you know, a gamified solution. And uh, essentially that will help them retain that for longer. And they will also understand that this is how they need to do it. So I'll, I'll let uh, Neeti take over and uh, talk about this. Thank you, Amit. And hello, everyone. Um, the first sample we talk about is largely themed around engagement through play. So tying back to what Amit earlier highlighted from the Towards Majority report that 46% organizations report people find compliance training boring and dull. So that's why the approach for gamification. And uh, this is to bring about a behavioral change through immediate feedback and instant reward features. So as I talk about, uh, as I walk through the sample, I will be highlighting aspects that led us to make deliberate design decisions. And um, yes, let me bring up the sample for you. Immediately what you see is, this is the first screen that learners see upon launch. It has one reflective question and it has a direct action point. So the idea here was to give learners the sense that there's not, this is not a heavy uh, intervention. There's nothing too overwhelming about the first screen. It just says, choose your environment and go. It has this immediacy and immediate action oriented feel to it. So uh, I, we believe this is an important point when you're talking about a subject that is 
uh, perceived dull and boring, even though it's something employees may or may not sense every day, which is workplace ergonomics. So it's immediately a call to action for employees to just dive into this. So let me choose one of the environments and go. So there is audio to this uh, uh, video that's playing, but it's being disabled at the moment. Um, the course starts with a context setting video. So you see an avatar, he's called Rod, and it's about the discomfort that he's facing because of his posture or because of some um, incorrect practices that he's been facing. So the idea here was to have an immediate connect between the learners and the content. So inclusion of an avatar, I think it does, uh, it works well in a context where it's largely you oriented, I mean, person oriented, where the subject is you or the employee. And uh, there's this immense impact of the work environment and the way you sit or the way you position yourself, the kind of office equipment you use. So this video largely uh, is meant for setting context. And since we're mindful here that uh, we'd like to uh, not dumb down the content, but give the employees the respect in terms of our perception of them as learners or end users of this course. So the idea was to keep it short and light, but still invoke some thoughts amongst employees' minds through Rod's thoughts himself. So where he says his back is in pain or uh, can you help me get things uh, straightened out? So a few short instructions and we click to launch the actual course. The first thing you see here, this is the gist of the course. You have on the left, you have this entire work environment that's depicted. And I think it's pretty accurate. I, I mean, he, he seems in this, he seems, he's like he's sitting in a very uncomfortable position. Uh, there's clearly some things that may be ergonomically wrong in this scenario. And it's about inviting employees to immediately take action and try things out, play around with the setup and see what works uh, in terms of reducing the risk of injury. So when we speak of reducing risk, we do have a risk indicator on the right. It shows the risks pertaining to the workstation and Rod's posture itself. And uh, there's the needle that is dynamic. And as you, as learners play around with the settings and play around with um, different aspects of his workstation, um, this meter will be dynamically showing what happens. And of course, you have a timer. This is part of the gamification elements. Uh, so immediately, the sense for learners is that it's a short and light uh, intervention. There's nothing too imposing about it. It's a five-minute thing that you can just quickly get done with. And of course, the scorecard for added interest. As soon as I hit start, I will talk about these, this inventory panel on the bottom. Uh, let me just start with this. As soon as I hit start, there's these uh, hotspots that are indicated in the work environment. And it's about getting through each of them. And I can hit done when I think I have addressed all the hazards. So let me quickly start off. And once I click a hotspot, there's immediately an action point for learners. It's about selecting the best possible option that uh, learners can take to help Rod uh, straighten out his um, ergonomic hazards or address them. So as soon as I say, maybe make him lean forward, there is a risk that gets introduced. If you see, the needle points to the right. So this immediate feedback, I think, is or we believe is very important in uh, putting learners on the spot and making them think about how they actually sit uh, on their workstation at their workstations. And as soon as I hit the correct answer, the risk is shown as reducing. So if I continue doing so, let me straighten his back out as well. Arms at 90. And let's see what, what happens with the chair. We do have a chair in the inventory on the bottom. Let me see what it brings up for me. So there's another, it's like prodding the learners to think about the workstation itself, Rod's posture, as well as workstation equipment. So let me see if I can replace the chair, which clearly has 
an adjustable uh, lever for the height. So the risk has been reduced. As I continue doing this, I keep making an attempt to reduce the risk. I still have about three minutes to go. And of course, there's items in the inventory. Let me add a footrest. His feet seem to be dangling. So again, that's a risk averted. Rod is missing something, let's say a laptop holder or a keyboard maybe. I think the keyboards. And then finally, neaten up the working space. And I think, oh, I see a clock as well. Again, this is an interesting one because uh, though it's not part of the workstation itself, or that's not the first thing you may think about when it comes to workplace ergonomics, but I think it's an important one. Ask him to take a break for a few minutes. All in all, I think it's done. As soon as I hit done, I could hit done and get done with it. Or I also have an option to reset. But as soon as I click done, um, the course allows me a summary of what I just uh, navigated, a list of the risks addressed, um, the risks that were not addressed, no separate mouse and keyboard, laptop not placed on holder. So there still were some things among the inventory that I could have used. Uh, but what this, uh, this little gamification, did, I, I'd like to call it a tidbit. It's, it's a short, sweet, light and fluffy one. So it also allows me to see what risks are introduced. Because when I'm trying to address certain risks, maybe I add in a phone or something, there should be newer risks introduced. So all these things, when I see this in like one snapshot, it shows me ergonomically what is the most conducive situation or the most conducive postures for me. And I think this correlation between having an actual avatar in front of you and be, to be able to adjust his surroundings or his own posture to lower risk, that really sets deep inside. Uh, it, it really helps ingrain the concept. And uh, ultimately, it can be supported with, of course, some additional resources to read through. And there you see a happy rod. He seems to be doing well. And I think it was a short and sweet one. There's nothing too heavy about it. And uh, this was about the sample. So, so when we talk about engagement through play, I think tying back to the concept of going beyond the obvious, it's about letting employees take the driver's seat, position themselves in Roth's shoes, or in this case, chair, and help them move along, take in the concepts and apply, apply them every day. Okay, so let's get to the next one. That was good. Okay, this is a very interesting one, you know. <laughs> so uh, I think we all know, and I'm sure we would have, uh, you know, maybe interacted with colleagues if we are not ourselves in the financial industry. Um, you know, we have heard of and read reports of finance companies getting fined for different compliance failures. Uh, code of conduct being one of them, you know, and just keep. many a times it happens because the staff wasn't clear whether that was allowed or not, whether this was right or not, even though they have done some compliance training and they have passed it successfully. So the challenge is that, you know, most compliance training around code of conduct is created uh, uh, on the basis of black and white rather than on the gray that they normally face in, in real life sometimes. So what we have set out to do, you know, uh, here is to create a solution which can possibly apply to more organizations than one. Uh, and this is a, a game-based solution which lets learners uh, see some aspects of those gray and make decisions based on that. So this is the one which is very close to uh, completion. We're just in the final stages of you know, stitching it together, but we have a, a, a reasonably good uh, demo lined up for you. So let Neeti take over once again and uh, talk a little bit more about this.
Great. So um, this is what we call the compliance hood. The game is called compliance hood. And uh, before I start with the actual walkthrough of this, like Amit said, this is still in, it's almost close to completion, but we do have some interesting, uh, an, an interesting walkthrough to give you a sense of the flow of the actual game. Um, this is very close to the data point that Amit mentioned about only 4% of people um, saying that they're motivated to learn in order to remain compliant. So, but in the context of let's say a financial institution, compliance to external regulations or compliance internally to company values, either of them, they are essentially very important and uh, cannot be ignored. The organization can't ignore it and neither should employees, but it's about how to impress that upon employees. And that's the reason we've uh, worked towards a game. Independently, it could function as its own learning unit or could be part of a much larger suite of courses, a, a larger suite of learning solutions. But I think it fits well perfectly in this context. So let me walk right through the sample. Typical login page where new users or uh, registered users can sign in. There's this quick short video that highlights the contextual relevance of the subject at hand. Again, even though it's a game, it's, uh, we think it's essential to tie it to the larger context. So even tying it to the theme of the actual game and the theme of compliance itself, I think this is about getting learners excited or employees excited about uh, what's coming up in the game, but as well as to get or, or be grounded to the context of learning, which is that compliance has heavy penalties associated with it, or I mean, non-compliance has penalties associated with it. So tying that to the context upfront in a very short, light way, maybe hardly less than a minute of video, and tying it to the compliance hood, a virtual environment where uh, learners need to ensure or work towards uh, operational order or creating order in the operational space to proceed in the game by answering compliantly. So as soon as this short video is done, we have a quick how to play. Now we wanted to create an experience that progressively goes from simple to complex. But as I say this slide, I understand that there may not be anything simple about compliance because as Amit mentioned, there's always the gray areas. There's hardly any questions that are going to be a clear yes or no answer. There are going to be uh, brain rackers, something that gets employees thinking, what if I were in this situation? So to get that progression across levels. We divided this game into three levels, three floors represented by three office floors. And there will be progressively uh, questions of increasing progression. I'm sorry, questions of increasing complexity. And um, yet at each stage, there will be some level of uh, some nudges for learners to think about the fine line between compliant and non-compliant. A few of the game elements, there will be an avatar selection page where learners can choose the avatar that they'd want to play to complete the journey of the compliance hood. Um, there will be question cards. So since this game is conceptualized as a virtual board game, at each step on the board or each tile on the board, learners will get a choice between two question cards. Now you see the plus five and the minus five. Uh, let's call these plus and minus values. This is essentially to introduce a sense of uh, decision point or an internal debate within amongst, employ um, amongst employees themselves uh, internally to see what their risk reward appetite is. So depending on whether they feel confident about answering a question, if they answer it correctly, let's say the 551, answering correctly goes, uh, pushes them forward five places, but answering the same question incorrectly uh, pushes them back five steps. So this is how the question cards are always in pairs. And uh, this we will talk about the internal conflict as well later. Um, there will be boosters along the way that help learners move ahead. So if they've consistently answered uh, incorrectly, which you wouldn't want to expect, but there will be a chance for boosters to pick up on your performance. 
So after the short intro, there's of course a simple instruction about how the game progresses, questions, you choose a response, and depending on how many questions you answer, your turns will be considered accordingly. This is a skippable introduction. And as soon as I am done with that tutorial, this is the avatar selection wheel. So there are five avatars to choose from and there will be animations on this. Um, so I could maybe choose between Chi and Lin. So learners can play around with this and see what avatars they'd like to choose. I will go for Lin. And a quick welcome message and I'm off on level one. This is the main journey or the map that employees will see. Uh, this is accessible at any point in the game through the settings or the menu button. And the, the red box represents game nudges that we will have along the way. So even if I've skipped the tutorial, I will have these initial nudges to get me started. The idea was to keep it, uh, not have a big learning curve to play the game itself. So short and light as before. I'm into level one and a quick dice roll and I'm off. Let me go five steps ahead. And this is my card selection point. I've still not played any turns, but I have to make a choice. Let's say I feel confident about answering this and I'm sure I will get five places. A quick scenario based question with supporting visuals. And as they get complex, there will be uh, contextual visuals that come in along with this. Let's see, is there a problem? I say yes. A quick flourish, maybe a little, a few sparkles and a few flourishes there. I see my avatar smiling about the correct answer and I proceed to the next question. And this is how the boosters will appear. I could collect my booster. There will be a short little jig that the character does or I don't know, something that shows me the booster has been acquired and the booster gets added in here. Let me select one to apply to the next question and booster applied. Let's say I still want to see if I choose a lower risk card and maybe let me say yes to this. I've unfortunately answered incorrectly. So in the absence of a booster, I will go back one point because that was the minus value of the card and I see an unhappy avatar. So I've gone back a place and I still need to choose. So as soon as I choose a question card, it's counted as, or as soon as I attempt a card, it's counted as a turn. So the idea is to uh, complete the level in not as few turns as possible, but the idea is to go on answering questions and see how that progresses you across the three levels. And maybe another question to demo. And another quick little jig from the avatar. And great, this is my summary screen for the first level. I've completed it in four turns. A smiling Lin and brings me to level two, which is now unlocked. And that's about the sample so far. We are in the process of adding um, fine tuned or, or fine tuning this and adding a little, a few more design elements to this. So I think in the context of uh, going beyond in our effort to. Um, make learning interesting. This is, this was an interesting example. I'd like to think of it as a catalyst for behavior change. Um, especially because it gives, um, it, it gives learners the opportunity to broaden their views and see what's out there. Because as opposed to reading just a big fat PDF of 15 pages saying, here are our company values, comply with them. It doesn't call out the, the possible scenarios. So as learning designers, we could definitely sit down and put together a few hundred questions about uh, what are the possible scenarios. And this is how they could be attempted in the game. The idea is to increase exposure or broaden their view about what could go wrong and prevent it through the game.
That's nice. Thanks, Nidhi. Uh, let's quickly see if there are any questions for us to answer. Hey, key coach, which tool did you use to implement this? So, uh, okay, so this is for the A4E one. I think so this was created in Flash at that point of time. So this is a little old, of course, but this was created in Flash. Hope that answers that. Uh, again, the same question and nice and short and to point. Okay, thank you, fantastic. So uh, we'll get into the third sample and hopefully we'll do that a little faster. It's also a little smaller one so that we have enough time for the fourth sample. We're just kind of uh, having about 15 minutes. Uh, so this one is uh, uh, a recent award winner from the next. This is a slightly unconventional structure. It's actually not even compliance program, you know, but we really want to bring this up because, you know, there's so much of uh, content that is being uh, thrown at compliance and sometimes very complex structures. So it's not the content itself which, uh, you know, troubles the learners. It is the structuring of the content and just making a mental map of it. You know, otherwise it is not so difficult. So if we can support our learners with a clever design, which we think this program has uh, in, in terms of unconventional structuring, making it a little easier for learners to go, go through. <coughs> so, excuse me. so mind you, this is not a compliance program, but it's a very interesting one, which we think can be easily adapted to uh, quite a few different compliance programs. Once, once again, uh, Niti will take over. And Sabit, so um, I will dive right into this sample uh, with a quick note that uh, the content for this particular sample was vast, abstract, and complex. And there could be several compliance-related subjects that fit this bill. And the idea here through this particular course that I'm going to showcase right now was to have a bird's eye view of the core principles. And after that, uh, allow learners or enable learners to see associations and relationships across concepts. So bringing up the actual course, um, the first thing that you see, this is the first shot that learners see upon launch. The course is titled Shared Decision Making. And the first thing that strikes me in this is, uh, again, it's less overwhelming. It's uh, it's a clean and minimalistic design. And since it's structured like a mind map, uh, now mind mapping has been around for, for a long time and structuring it around a core, a central core idea. That was the idea behind the structuring for this particular course. So there is, this, I think there is a certain joy in discovering uh, the clusters and nodes yourself. So as soon as I hit start, there is, a quick learning objectives and you see the clusters populate. So as opposed to a standard MLTP structure, this has a cluster node and sub node structure. So the idea is again to keep the central core idea in place and cluster one talks about basic concepts and cluster two is about applying the concepts. So this is about a shared decision making model and uh, as you can see, I will also talk about the navigation elements quickly. There is a big pan and zoom option available. Uh, as soon as I click on a cluster, I can see the nodes within it. So especially it is spread out across a, a much larger um, stage area. So there is there are sufficient controls in place for this. We have the standard transcript. We have the option to print. And another interesting feature we have is bookmarking. Let's say I want to bookmark this particular uh, thing. I can simply click the star icon and it will show up in my bookmarks. Um, and um, this just helps me retrieve things quicker. So uh, this particular structure resonates really well with me because uh, throughout, whether you're analyzing client inputs, whether you're analyzing uh, a business challenge, it's about putting the central idea in this, in this or the main idea in the center and thinking about the offshoots that come off it. So this is a great way to uh, organize content, whether or not it's actually presented as part of the design, but this, uh, the course is therefore very um, compact to me. So 
even in terms of the in, uh, the way content is presented it's quite light it's not uh, it's not too heavy on content we do have some role play videos and uh, infographic style layouts to present content which makes for a very um, less intensive experience if i may put it that way and also some video segments in cluster 2 and funny thing is or interesting thing is that when i hit cluster 2 cluster 1 collapses again so my focus is always maintained on uh, the core idea at hand these are some of the role play videos that are included in this with custom illustrations there is audio to this again but it's been disab disabled at the moment yes so i can yeah explain or talk about it um again the little i think the transparency here is important because no matter what node i'm in i do see this cluster and the mind map in the background so i always know what the core idea is uh, and it, it it just helps to put things together in one place and i think it's a quite an easy and quite a, a rich experience so that's about this sample So again, it's about the unconventional structuring and letting learners relate to the heart of the matter and let them get a better understanding of all the branches and offshoots while keeping the center at heart. All right, that was so quick. Uh, let's quickly get to our last sample so that we are able to include all of them. All right, so this is, this is uh, very, very interesting because it, I think in my view applies to a lot of situations uh, and it, it has a very interesting story as well. So this has been done for a client who we worked with for a few years and was really wanting to do something better with uh, e-learning, you know, better than what we have done in past. So there came an opportunity for a, you know, a normal safety program, slip trips and falls, which could be essentially they wanted to convert to uh, e-learning. So, uh, you know, uh, at the same time, very interestingly, they had a, a learner survey done, which pointed to uh, you know, something that we picked on and tried to define a solution around that. Some of their staff was saying that we do not apply what we learn in uh, safety training because our managers don't apply that. So, Essentially, and coming back to what the research was telling us, there are a lot of people who do not apply what they learn in safety trainings. Uh, what we're seeing here is one of those influences could be your immediate managers, which also the report said that involving managers is very important. So here what is really happening is all the knowledge that you give to your staff, if your environment and culture is not able to support it, and typically the first line, line managers are really the most important influencers there, uh, it's not going to really work. It's not going to change anything on the ground. So we really suggested them to go for a, you know, a learning campaign, which is really, you know, modeled around a marketing campaign. As you would imagine, a marketing campaign, the only purpose of any marketing campaign is really to, you know, uh, uh, get uh, some action from consumers or people whom they're trying to influence, you know, or influence their behaviors. And that's exactly what we you know, have set out to do this. So this is like, you know, of course, very different solution from what they were looking for when they came to us. But I think it is evolving into a fantastic solution, which in my view can be applied to many different situations wherever we are really looking to change behaviors or influence behaviors. So again, I'll let the Niti uh, talk about it and share more. Yes, back to the last uh, sample of this uh, webinar. And it's based on the 31% of learners openly admitting they do not apply what they've learned. So we'd like to think of it as not every business problem needs e-learning treatment. So in Amit's brief introduction to this um, sample, I think that's a fitting way to put it. Um, I will skip through. Yeah, this is about what a learning, what we think a learning campaign addresses and i will talk about these three points across the slides so let me go to the actual phasing of the content 
of the campaign. We developed this as a five-phased approach. Awareness, motivation, preparation, demo, and commitment and maintenance. So depending on a single objective for each phase of the campaign, uh, it takes employees from a journey or it is carved as a journey that starts with knowing what it means to have a culture of safety to why it's important to live safety as a culture and how they can embody safety as a culture uh, with an opportunity to uh, share their stories about what living with uh, living a culture of safety means to them and how they've been applying that to their daily work and commitment and maintenance which is really about keeping a track or monitoring how this particular intervention or how the series of interventions um, helps put employees in that perspective. It could be simply as having managers monitor uh, how each component is received. So like Amit mentioned, it's about the tone at the top. If the top leaders percolate the, are able to percolate this message and um, imbibe the culture of safety themselves, and they have the support of the middle managers and senior managers, it becomes easier to get the rest of the staff together to look at this uh, common goal of importance of safety in the workplace. So this is largely about evaluating on the go. So it's not just evaluation at the last phase of the campaign, but as you go along. So um, the campaign was phased across a period of six months. So different components with different media elements, different modes of communication to make for a very unique experience. And the choice of design components was largely driven by um, some inputs from a survey that uh, the, our clients had internally conducted, which gave us a sense of what kind of interventions a particular department prefers, what kind of uh, monitoring approaches they prefer. So these became very important inputs for us to actually work on components. So this is where I'll talk about the first phase, uh, which was about to create, which was about creating awareness. And we had something like leadership messages since endorsement of something, a concept like this is very important. We have some visually rich posters with strong visual messaging that anyone that should catch anyone's eye. So it's components like this, which do not really depend on access to certain devices, specific devices, but these can be these can be presented in common areas where most of your staff are likely to pass by at any point in time. So as Amit mentioned, this is on its way to being developed, but we can show you a few samples. So this was our idea of presenting um, leadership videos in common areas. So something like Um, maybe a lobby or a reception or a cafeteria and something that says this is a message from our very own leader or CEO. So this is an example of uh, a video type that we'd like to include. And um, and we'd like to work with that as I do in um, the previous slide in common areas where it can be viewed. Um, this is an example of a poster where we have embedded a QR code which can be scanned through your mobile apps. And this was mainly to create interest in terms of what lies ahead. So if you scan this with your mobile app, it currently links to another project that we did. Uh, but the idea was to create a buzz, create some uh, uh, a sense of uh, context or sense of closeness to the subject itself. So it's this is still in progress, but we thought we'd show you what we currently are working on. So this was about the campaign. And again, this one was about keeping things rolling, keeping the momentum, a long sustaining uh, solution with incremental opportunities. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> we just uh, uh, wrapped up on the uh, end of that hour, half hour. 
Uh, okay, uh, if you can quickly pick up any questions. So there are no new questions, but uh, if there are any, feel free to send them across to us. We will be sharing a recording of this. Uh, if you have any questions uh, which uh, are beyond this presentation, feel free to reach out to us on any of our social channels or directly to us. We're both on LinkedIn. That's the best way to reach us. Uh, once again, thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar. I hope you like the samples and uh, hopefully you can influence your own programs with these if, if they were of, of that kind that really, you know, you know, made that mark for you. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you everyone. Thanks for your time.